Hello friends, welcome to a series of lectures on understanding corneal elevation based topography or what we call as a tomography with a special focus on pentacam. So after the end of this course, which will be divided into several parts, we would expect you to understand how to interpret both corneal topography based maps as well as corneal elevation based maps which is also called as tomography, corneal tomography with a special focus on pentacam. So here in part one of this series, we are going to discuss about corneal topography which are basically curvature based maps and we will also see why we need to shift from a curvature based map corneal topography to an elevation based map or corneal tomography with a special focus again on the pentacam so friends if you were to give a spectacle lens to a doctor or an ophthalmologist and asked for a description of the properties of the lens. The ophthalmologist would likely put it into a lensometer and tell you the power of the lens, right? So he will tell you that this glass power is plus four diopters. If you were to give the same lens to an optical engineer, say, or an optician, right? You'd likely get the readings of the anterior and posterior curvatures of that lens. He might be giving you the central thickness of the lens and also might give you a description of uh, how the shape transitions from the center to the periphery of the lens material, right? Both descriptions are correct, but one is more detailed. The ophthalmologist's reading of the single power of the lens in air is optically correct but tells us very little about the lens actually performs how the lens actually performs the optician's description is more detailed but it is devoid of any power description however by knowing the physical properties supplied by the optician however you would be able to reconstruct the lens and compute the lens power so what I am communicating here is that understanding the power of a lens in this case, the corneal power that is derived from the keratometry is not sufficient to understand the shape of the cornea. Just like the same glass power can be made of different shapes over here. Plus four can be made from a biconvex design with an anterior a power of plus two and a posterior power of plus two. You can also get a plus four in the glass power from a convex or plano lens with a plus four on the convex side and zero on the plano. And then you can also have a plus eight on the anterior side and a minus four on the posterior side from a meniscus lens, right? So the power of that lens does not help us understand the shape of the lens. Same is with cornea. So here we can appreciate why corneal topography became popular at a time when lens power was derived from keratometers. So on two to three decades back, when we were still on the monofocal IULs and still maybe the LASIK was not very popular, we used to derive the corneal power from the keratometer, right? But the keratometer gives us the dietary value of the cornea, but it does not give us any understanding of the shape of the cornea. So shape of the cornea, we came to understand from corneal topography, which were more of a placido disc based. So placido disc meaning alternate 
white and dark rings being projected onto the anterior corneal surface and the reflection of which is studied. The reflection actually helped the corneal topographer to understand how steep or flat the cornea is. So the projected concentric rings are referred to as myers and let me bring my pointer out over here. So these are basically the myers and these are concentric rings and they're also referred to as you know, uh, placido uh, these best myers, right? So similar to a topographic map of a mountain areas where the myers appear closer together correspond to a steeper corneal curvature. In corneal topography also, the more the myers are closely together, it signifies a steeper cornea. The more the myers are separated, right, it will signify a flat cornea, right. So that's very fundamental. The myers can actually give an information regarding the quality of the surface also. So distinct well-formed myers are referred to as crisp and suggest the underlying corneal surface to be regular and smooth. So in this picture, uh, the top right is the placido disc reference mire which is thrown on the anterior cornea and the reflection of which you may see in the other three images over here you can see. So one reflection here is like having an astigmatism, the other one is quite a normal cornea, the mire looks like a normal cornea and then you have a keratoconus, right? But it is very difficult to understand uh, you know, the cornea just by looking at the myers. And to help us, you know, analyze the cornea, a color-coded map is provided so that we have a more detailed understanding of the cornea. But behind that color-coded map, the computer actually analyzes this placido discs, uh, you know, the reflection of the placido myers, and kind of throws us the map. So here you can see uh, the Placido Discs Meyer projections from the anterior cornea, reflections from the anterior cornea, and the topography map is provided by analyzing this uh, Myers, the Placido Disc Myers, right? And you can see the color codes are being provided over here, which starts from blue, and then as you move up, you will see the green ones and then comes the a little yellowish, raw orange and red. So as you move from the blue to green to yellow, it means the cornea in that part is becoming more and more steeper, right? So blue is basically the easy way to understand this is, remember this, is that blue is the um, color of the ocean, right, or the sea, so that's sea level. So blue is basically the flattest area of the cornea. So that's basically, you know, reflected over here, the bluish uh, color. Then you find the green, which is also flat, but not as flat as like that of the blue, right? So it's more of a land, you know, uh, but it is, it is a little steeper than that of the blue regions, which is like a mean sea, sea level. Now you have the green part, which is a little steep, steeper than the blue, but it's still, uh, when compared to the other areas, these are basically flat areas, the blue and the green. And as you move up, you can see this, the yellow is a little more steeper, uh, values of around 44.5, 45.5 diopters. So these are basically areas which are a little steeper and as you move further away to the center of the cornea in this map, you can see it's coming becoming a little reddish. So that basically means that the cornea is, is steepest in this part, which is depicted by the red color. And that could be, uh, and if you, if you want to make a reference to that, it's basically around 47, 48 diopters over here, right? So 
that is how you analyze the cornea uh, you don't have to remember this by heart because as you go across with many understanding many different cornea topographic maps you will remember that the blue portion is the flattest the green is flat and then you move as you move towards yellow the cornea becomes more and more steeper and then red is something which is the steepest part of the cornea the one thing that uh, you need to also remember is that if you change this you can see here it's a difference of one diaptus right so 41.5 to 42.5 43.5 it's the scale is of that of one diaptus if you change the scale to 0.5 diaptus and you will see in some maps the scales are in increments of 0.5 diaptus then this map may also change and what you are making it is actually you're making it more sensitive right so it is very important before you analyze this map it's important that you understand what is the scale you know and make sure that you have consulted your uh, uh, the your uh, uh, the uh, industry sales people and you have come to uh, and, and you are using the right scale right because not using the right scale can totally change the cornea right it can make a healthy cornea look a little abnormal or an abnormal cornea look a little healthy right the other point i wanted to make over here is that remember in a character in a topographer in a topography machine uh, the central part of this Placido Myers, the central one millimeter, the data is actually extrapolated data. That is because the computer, uh, sorry, the topographer will actually have the camera there. So a topographer, which is based on Placido disk, cannot measure the central one millimeter of that cornea and what you find over here is basically the data over here is more of an extrapolated data so that is why it's a little challenge for lasik patients because you know in the lasik patients the patients will have the in the central one millimeter will be the flattest portion of that patient who has undergone a myopic lasik treatment right so sometimes if you go with the topographic machine that data which is extrapolated data it doesn't actually in reality measure that central one millimeter you could have a hyperopic surprise why because if your topography machine is extrapolating data and it is not really measuring the central one millimeter then that one millimeter is often flatter than what the data suggests here so here you can see 46.76 tab to the steep k the flat k is 42.389 uh, but the central one millimeter can be a lot flatter than what is being suggested over here and then you could get an hyperopic surprise so topographic machines have a limitation there and that's exactly what we are doing in part one we are trying to understand why we do we need to go to an elevation based topography or pentacam elevation based topography which we often call as a tomography machine so just to revisit what we talked about in the last slide um, is that remember the blue is uh, flattest the green is flat flat and then as you move to the yellow and red marks then you basically have uh, you're going uh, to a more corneal steeper regions uh, normal cornea is actually prolate in shape so the central part would be a little steeper than the periphery and that is what you were saying over here in this cornea so the periphery is flat than the cornea which is in the in the in the middle of the cornea in the center of the cornea and that's basically the shape of a prolate uh, cornea which average patients have but what this patient also have is basically some amount of astigmatism because if you see the bow tie design over here 
right? the bow tie design. That basically signifies the patient is having an astigmatism and regular astigmatism because that's basically the bow tie design. That bow tie design here in this case is the patient is having a with the rule astigmatism. If this bow tie was horizontally placed, then it would have been an against the rule astigmatism. Or if the bow tie would have been placed somewhere here, then it would have been something like oblique astigmatism. Anything between 135 degrees to 155 degrees would be around oblique astigmatism in this way. That doesn't matter whether your bow tie is placed vertically, horizontally, or oblique. The patient has regular astigmatism. But in this picture, what you see here is that the patient does not have a regular astigmatism. And you can see that there's no bow tie pattern over here. You have a typical bow tie pattern over here. There's no bow tie pattern of the red, um, you know, this, uh, or the, the red part over here is, has a bow tie pattern. There's no bow tie pattern over here. In fact, um, you know, as you learn to interpret topography maps, you can see that there is basically a crab claw design, a crab claw shape over here. And that's basically a hallmark of a peripheral uh, disease of the cornea, which is called the pellucid marginal degeneration. So in this map, the patient could have a suspected pellucid marginal de degeneration, but that could be, you know, um, it would be very difficult to say just from topography maps, it would be easier to see other parameters in an elevation based topography map like Pentacam or maybe any shame flood based topography maps because they give a lot of parameters. In a placido based topography map, the challenge is that if the patient is not fixating, sometimes you can see strange, you know, uh, patterns. But that may not be because the patient has a disease that could be because the patient has not fixated well and the reading has not been proper the the acquisition of the image hasn't been proper well the other point that i would like to uh, bring to your attention is about simulated keratometry or the same k now, this is something that you will find in all topography machines. They will give you a value of which is seam K, right? And the values of seam K, the steep meridian and the flat meridian values from the seam K actually is from the three millimeter, the central three millimeters of the cornea, depending, of course, on the make of the, con of the machine. Uh, Generally speaking, it is the same K is a value from the central three millimeters of the cornea. And uh, the same K is also taken only from the anterior cornea. It is only taken from the anterior cornea. The same K is not a measurement which also includes the posterior cornea. Most topography machines, which are placido based, actually the placido myers would, would, are only reflections from the anterior cornea, remember. So it does not measure the posterior cornea. And the simulated keratometry measures, uh, measurements are always from the anterior cornea. So there are some topography machines like the OPSCAN, which is based on placido disc technology, which is basically measuring the anterior cornea with placido myers and it also measures the posterior cornea with a sleep pin technology so it can actually give you the total corneal power the net corneal power of the uh, net corneal power map but even in that those topography machines which actually measures the posterior cornea the simulated keratometry reading is only from the anterior cornea. The values are only from the anterior cornea. And they are from the central three millimeters of the cornea generally. Why simulated or simke? The name actually signifies that we, if you have to compare the values of the topography machine with your keratometry values, then you should always 
compare it with the simulated keratometry because your keratometer is a measurement from the anterior cornea. If you have to compare those values and it is a measurement, the keratometry values are a measurement from the central 2.5 to 3 millimeters of the cornea. So if you have to compare that with the topographic values, then you should always look into the simulated keratometry, which is simulating the keratometer. The topography maps could, could actually give you different shapes of the cornea. Here you can see a little round shape over here with very central steepening. You can see an oval shape over here. You can also see superior steepening, right? And inferior flattening over here. You can see in this, uh, uh, in this image, you see inferior steepening and superior flattening. And uh, sometimes a hallmark of keratoconus because keratoconus is often associated with inferior steepening on the y-axis. You can see a typical irregular cornea. Remember that irregularity could be also not just because of structural uh, defects of the cornea, but could be also because of dry eyes or ocular surface disease, right? And this is the symmetric bow tie that we talked about, which signifies that the patient has astigmatism, which is very, which is very regular in shape. In this, in this picture, we are seeing a with the rule astigmatism. This is also a bow tie, but it is not, it has a skewed axis. So compared to this symmetric bow tie, you see a skewed axis over here. And later on in part two, you will find when can we have a toric lens, when we can put a toric lens in patients with a skewed bow tie, with a symmetric bow tie with skewed axis, only when this skewing is less than 20 degrees and we'll talk about that in part two. This is an asymmetric bow tie. You can see over here, it's not symmetric, it's asymmetric bow tie. Where they would like to go for with the toric lens is depending upon your clinical decision and would also need to see carefully the central three millimeters of the cornea. If this central three millimeter or four millimeters of the cornea you see there's a symmetric shape and probably you can go ahead with it with the toric lens. But if you, in the central three to four millimeters, you see that the asymmetric shape is there, then you can expect a lot of residual astigmatism with the patient. Again, an asymmetric bow tie with superior steepening over here, right? And then an asymmetric bow tie with skewed radial axis again here, right? SRAX. When we drive to the office, most of us looked at our speedometers, right? In the yesterday years, 20 years before, how did you understand the distance from your home to your office? You saw this, you saw basically the speedometer which gave you the distance, right? So in older cars, the speed is also determined by the rotation of the tires. The distance is also you know, determined between two places by the rotation of the tires, right? And how did they do that? There was a simple gear mechanism that measured the rate of rotation of the tire. But you will be surprised probably to know that if you were living in a very cold country and during the winter time, you went from a summer tire to a winter tire and the diameter of uh, that tire actually changes, then your speed meters accuracy will also vary because the distance or the speed, whatever it is measuring, is based on the tires, right? Compared to that, in today's uh, world with advanced cars fitted with GPS systems, how do they measure the distance? Also, how do they measure the speed of the car? It is through a GPS navigation system, right? So, so the GPS uses a series of, you know, satellites and a triangulation method to determine where you are at any instant in the art and how far you have gone to another place. So basically that determines the speed and also it basically determines, you know, the positions. So it gives you the distance also, right? So the process of this triangulation 
with a GPS device is very accurate, right? And it does not depend upon the rotation of the tire. It does not depend upon whether you are on a summer tire or a winter tire, right? So that makes the GPS system, uh, you know, more accurate rather than yesteryears when speed was measured with the rotation of the tires or distance was measured between your home and office with the rotation of tires. So friends, in the last slide, we took the example of a speedometer and a GPS-based system. The corneal topography is actually the term topography is a misnomer because true, true topography involves an understanding of the elevation and of the contour of the land and then deriving the curvature. However, corneal topography does not understand the elevation. It does not determine the elevation and from there it does not derive the curvature. What it does, it, it understands the reflections of the placido disc from the anterior curvature. And two points in the cornea may have the same curvature, but if they are on two different elevations, then their performance will be different. That is exactly what elevation-based topography maps or shame flood based tomography or topography maps does. They try to first derive the elevation and from there they try to derive the curvature and give you the power. For example, if you think of two houses, they're built of the same material but one house is at a five feet above the sea level, the other is 20 feet above the sea level, then the performance is different. When there is a huge storm or a tornado or a hurricane, right? So that's basically the difference between corneal topography, which is video keratoscope, anterior surface reflections, and corneal tomography, which is elevation-based topography, which is based on the shame flood principle. 